We are in week three of this particular study, and we are at what you would call a leadership critical moment. Have you ever been there? You, you, you know that you're sort of um, at this time in your life, whether it's maybe with your family or at work or uh, just with you personally, and, and things can go a certain way for a certain while without maybe any kind of necessary leadership. It's kind of, kind of like coasting, it's kind of the norm. But then there are those moments in life where you're like, man, this is a leadership critical moment. Oh. Nehemiah found himself there. The people of God found themselves in a leadership critical moment. Uh, anytime you want to see something revived, anytime you want to see something beautiful brought to life, anytime you don't want to continue the norm, you're going to find yourself at a leadership critical moment. And if you find yourself there, you can do a few things. You can look to the Word of God, you can look to God the counsel, or you can go to the internet. <laughs> I may have done two of those things. And here's, here's how I want to start. Here's how I want to start. Just because it's interesting, is it not, to find out what the, what the world has to say about leadership? It's kind of like interesting. I wonder what the, the, the world's actually pretty into leadership. Did you know that? I mean, like, if you go to, um, well, there used to be these things called bookstores, okay? Now you just go to Amazon. But if you did a book, like, sort of like search, and you were wondering what the world had to say about leadership, then you could probably find a ton of resources. But I also think it's fun to think about what songs have to say about current topics. Because you know that songs and movies are a reflection of our culture. So here's what I did. I just simply Googled, um, I forget the search, but it was like leadership songs. That's a really weird search, by the way, right? Leadership songs. You're not really sure what's going to come up, but I have for you eight songs that can teach us about leadership. I, I selected five because I wasn't sure about all eight. And, and here they are, okay? So these are, uh, these are eight songs, uh, according to the internet, that can teach you about leadership. Uh, and and maybe, maybe this will kind of set the tone for today. Uh, the first one, uh, Man in the Mirror by Michael Jackson. Now here's the deal, here's the deal. I, I don't particularly care for that song, but here's what, here's what, here's what I, I recognize. If you allow for about five to 10 seconds of nothingness after I say man in the mirror, you will involuntarily start humming man in the mirror. I don't even like the song, but now here's what happens. You just got that song stuck in your head. Unless I can undo it, watch this. Song number two uh, that can teach you about leadership would be I'm Not Afraid by Eminem. Song number three that can teach you about leadership is called Imagine by John Lennon. Okay, so I, you know, if we waited five or ten seconds, that could probably get in your head, right? Imagine, no. I'm singing publicly. That should never happen. All right, song four. This one can definitely get in your head, depending on kind of like what your music genre is like. It's by our friend uh, Bob Marley, uh, Get Up, Stand Up. <laughs> Some of you are there. You're there. You didn't need five or ten seconds. You were already there. Get up. Okay, and then, um, and let's see, song number five, now this is really, this might, <laughs> this might date you, okay, um, if you're like going to get really excited about this song, uh, but it is probably something that can teach you about leadership, and it's by the Bee Gees, and the song is called Stayin' Alive. <laughs> Stayin' Alive. <laughs> ooh, ooh, ooh. Stayin' Alive. Uh, so, hey, listen, those are the five songs um, that, that can kind of teach you. I think we hit most genres there. Hopefully everyone's kind of happy and not too offended that um, your genre was missed. But here's what we're really going to do. We're really going to look at God's Word and see how the Gospel affects our leadership. We're going to take a look at Nehemiah because that's the study we're in. We're going to say, okay, hey, here's kind of like Nehemiah's journey. I love this journey, ready? From onlooker to leader. From onlooker to leader. And then we're going to see, like, what is the God? How does the gospel affect this? Because we don't want to just teach principles here. This isn't just about, like, go do these things and you'll be better. This is about, like, how does the gospel radically affect manhood, as you just heard? How does the gospel radically affect leadership? How does the gospel radically affect all that you are? 
Uh, and so that's where we always want to center our messages on what is G how does Jesus sort of turn this stuff upside down. But the context of our study is going to be 400 years before Jesus with a guy named Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah, um, his scene is such that uh, he, the people of God had been taken captive by the Babylonians. So let's, for, for um, just visual sake, Nehemiah's over here. He's in captivity with most of God's people. Over there is Jerusalem. Now, God, in the Old Testament, like, um, he shined in and through Jerusalem. And the plan was that people would see the difference of Jerusalem and be attracted to this holy and righteous and loving God. That's a problem if your people are all over here in captivity. But God's like, I'm not going to leave you there. Love you too much. Even though you're crazy disobedient and that's what you deserve, I'm not going to leave you there. I'm actually going to ransom you and bring you back. And so he starts uh, bringing some people back. There's this guy named Ezra. He goes back a little bit before Nehemiah. And then, and then Nehemiah gets a call to go back. And here's, here's the situation that Nehemiah walks into. As he's coming back to Jerusalem, he can see that the, like the foundation and the temple, they're, they're being rebuilt. So spiritual things are happening. But the problem is there's no walls. And back in the day, that was a really big deal. That meant there was no protection. It meant that Israel remained, according to the scriptures, um, the word they used was shameful. It was like, okay, you can have your little, your little church area, but you're not strong enough to protect it, so your God must not be very strong. It sent the wrong message, and it broke Nehemiah's heart that his people and his God were being represented as weak and vulnerable and open to attack. So Nehemiah comes back into this scene where the walls are, are in shambles, the gates are burned down, and he realizes that his people are in need of a leader. This is a leadership critical moment. And what we've been doing here over the last couple of weeks is we're going to take, we've been taking a look at how um, in week one, Nehemiah like, gets himself really close to the problem. Week two, we realized how for a while the people were working kind of as tribes next to each other. But then when, when some hardship happened, it was actually a good thing because it made them face each other. And they started working together, not just as tribes. This week, we're going to take a look at Nehemiah's journey from somebody who looked onto the situation as opposed to somebody who actually led in the situation. So it's the journey from onlooker to leader. And I think we're gonna be able to recognize some of our own journey, hopefully that you're on, from potentially being an onlooker right now to a situation maybe at your church, at your home, at work, to leader. Because I believe that God has called us to be much more than simply an onlooker. I want to pray today. I'm, I want to pray for us, but I also want to pray for John. John's preaching at a church plant um, that uh, we've helped to support called Cruciform. Uh, it's down south here in, in Florida. So uh, John's one of our pastors, and, and we just uh, so if you'll pray with me for the both of us and all pastors who who bring the word of God today, that would be awesome. Father, I come to you, and I just want to say thank you, Lord, for teaching me about your love for us. Father, you are a God who does have this relentless and reckless love that just keeps coming after us and fills us with good things. Um, Father, we've called it the better party. Um, we've called it different things, but, but we know that you are where our life is uh, hidden. And Lord, we thank you for coming to us and not being an onlooker yourself, but rather leading in in order to, to give us that love. We pray that you would capture us with that love today, Father. I pray for John that you would fill him with your Holy Spirit, Lord, that your hand would be upon him, that he would be bold, kind, and courageous as he presents the gospel message to Cruciform, that you would bring life there that's not there, Lord, and I pray that you would bring just healing and uh, provision, Father, to that church, that it would flourish and make your name famous, that the walls would be built up, the gates would be repaired, and that your people would be solidified, not to be excluded from the world, Lord, but that the world might be included and brought into this special work that you're doing. Father, would you do all those same things here? Fill us with your Holy Spirit. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. 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 All right. So if you have, if you have a Bible, cool. Um, we're going to be in Nehemiah. If you want a Bible, we have them out in the lobby. And if not, we'll have some of the verses behind me. Uh, and some of what I'm going to do is be walking through uh, 
about four chapters today, so there's going to be some highlight verses um, that keep us going. We also, uh, as you came in, you received an outline uh, that would be helpful to you if you kind of, like, you know, my wife tells me it helps me to, to, to kind of track with you, kind of track with you. And so uh, sometimes she's surrounded by children who might make her track elsewhere. So uh, you might find the outline helpful to you as, as we go through it. So um, we're going we're gonna to hop right in. We're going to take, take a look at sort of the, the journey that Nehemiah had between onlooker um, and then leader. So you see some blanks there on your outline. The first one is this, just to, to, to keep you going. Um, an onlooker is basically defined by what you see. By what you see. You know you're an onlooker. If you're known more for what you see, and maybe even what you say, rather than what you do, you're really good at seeing the problem. You're really good at telling people what the problem is. You just haven't done anything about the problem. You might be an onlooker. You might be, it's okay. Let's just take a little inventory. Say, hey, okay, you know what? I'm an onlooker because I can tell all the things that are wrong with, fill in the blank. You, you probably have the skill of onlooking. That's not a bad thing, actually. You actually need to be an onlooker before you're a leader. You can't just jump into leadership. The second blank there is, is uh, becoming a leader. Becoming a leader is not about what you see. It's actually even not about what you do. It's how you empower. Empower is your word. So it's kind of a difference today between seeing and empowering, and really the journey from being able to see certain things to being able to empower others around you. Hey, Nehemiah 2, verses 11 through 16 is where we're going to take a look at Nehemiah, the onlooker. So he, uh, he comes to the scene, and, and we pick it up in, in verse 11 of chapter 2. So I went to Jerusalem, and there were three, and I was there three days. Then I arose in the night, and um, I and a few men with me, and I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. Okay, so nobody knows what's going on yet. There was no animal with me but the one on which I rode. I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. He's, he's an onlooker. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool. But there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. I love, I love the Bible. And what's really cool about the Bible is sometimes there's just these specific like, details that, I mean, I don't care that Nehemiah had to get off his animal right there. I don't know, maybe you do. But what I love about it, it reminds me that this is history. This isn't just like some fairy tale. This is actual historical events that were carefully brought together so that we would have some legitimacy to the things that we believe. Verse 15. Then I went up in the night by the valley and inspected the wall, and I turned back and entered the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing. And I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. Okay, so those first couple of verses, Nehemiah, he's checking out the scene. He's an onlooker. He's seen the problems. The walls really are in bad shape. The gates, no good. It's not an awesome situation. Let's look at his journey here to leadership. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. How Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem, that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good. How would your life change if you believed the hand of God was upon you? Well, well, how, would, that, would that make Monday any different? Friday night? Saturday? If you believe that the hand of Almighty God was upon you for good. Now I told him the hand of my God was that had been upon me for good and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. The king over there back in Babylonia let him go. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. Nehemiah beginning to become a leader in empowering others. And so really what we're going to do today, it's not just in that particular passage. We're going to take a look over like five to six chapters of Nehemiah's journey 
from onlooker to leader. And, and like we've been looking at each of these different passages, I say the word journey because I believe it's a process, but I don't believe these things always happen in order. Does that make sense? Okay, so you're going to hear certain things, and for you, you might identify with, oh, that, that happened back there, but that hasn't happened yet. That's cool. The idea here is just that you would process with us. These are very likely things that are going to be happening on your journey from onlooker to leader um, as well. And, and, and so uh, we want to we wanna highlight some of that stuff. Uh, and so beginning uh, is, is kind of like in, in verse 2, or in chapter 2, we're going to take a look at Nehemiah's journey. First we see a calling in, in verse 12. Um, I'm going to highlight some of this stuff. Uh, you don't have it there on your outline. If you want to take notes um, off to the side on, on where, these, where these things are and, and what they are, uh, that might be helpful for you to go back and read them. I'm going to reference them, but uh, it, it, it would actually get you reading a few chapters of Nehemiah this week, which would be awesome. I want to say hello to our online community. Hey guys watching, I know it's stormy out here, so we don't judge you for not coming out. Although those of you who came out, there is a treat for you. I'm not lying, actually, there's a treat. Those of you who did not come out, um, we'll try to save some of that treat for you next week when you guys come back out. But um, I understand staying dry today, but it's awesome that you guys braved. Uh, this would be kind of like our, our winter, you know, like this is like a snowstorm for us, this big rain. And so um, thank you for coming out through that. And hello, online community. 2.12. 2.12. Again, for time's sake, I mean, we don't have time to read all these, but, but you see in 2.12 that Nehemiah had a calling. You know what's cool about... So, here's the difference. Um, when I'm talking about like a gospel-centered, godly leader versus somebody who just has power or authority. Calling. Calling is one of the big differences between like just being the boss or being in a leadership position and actually having the hand of God upon you for good. Uh, me and I had a call. It's like God wanted him to do something specific uh, and God let him know that. We'll make these touch base in just a moment here for you guys, but just encourage you to be processing, do I have a call? I mean, I know I have a calling to follow Jesus. That's, that's the calling that's general of all people who believe in Christ, that I would follow Christ and his ways and teach others to do the same. But, but is my calling the same as Joe's calling? And is that the same as Catherine's calling? It, is it possible, maybe, maybe there's like a secondary calling to my initial calling to follow Jesus that's more specific to my gift mix and to my personality and to the situation God's put me in? Would the answer is yes. But do I know it? And how am I responding to it? Second thing we see here is uh, Nehemiah in, in chapter 2, verses 12 through 15, he took inventory. He took inventory of the situation. He looked at the situation and he was like, yo, that's really bad. Like specifically, that gate's bad, that wall's bad. Like, like I'm, I'm looking at the situation and I am, I'm taking it all in and I'm defining reality. That's like sometimes job number one or two of the leader. It's like, let's, let's define some reality here. Things are not good or things are good. We have these resources or we don't. If you're going to move from onlooker to leader, I mean, understanding what you have to work with is super important even before you dis determine where you want to go. Number three here is prayer. We see this in chapters 1, 2, and 4. Nehemiah was a leader of prayer on his journey. Prayer was like a really um, important thing to him. And you don't see Nehemiah, um, you know, uh, off. So Jesus, you, you get a bit more of a glimpse of where he goes off. And he, he spends uh, a lot more time in, in uh, sort of what I might call relational prayer, where he's talking with his father. And he goes off to do that. That's important. And that's good. Nehemiah gives us more of a snapshot of like situational prayer where he's in the situation and before he actually speaks to the authority or before he, he speaks to the people or before he acts, he'll just, he'll just be in constant contact with God. Like, you know, Father, help me. You know, and he'll, he'll just be continuing, continuing to talk to his, his power source, if you will. So these are, these are brief but powerful moments that kind of help reorient Nehemiah in this journey of leadership. Deployment. In chapters 3 and 4, we see a ton of deployment with Nehemiah. We see Nehemiah deploy everybody in chapter 3. That's when they were working side to side. I don't know if you remember that from last week, but these people were next to these people were next to these people, and they were doing a specific work. So Nehemiah probably could have built the whole wall by himself. 
in like 40 or 50 years. Or he could have deployed, empowered other people to get after the work in much quicker and more efficient time. We see in, in his journey, he learns, maybe he knew it back, back when he was a cupbearer, we don't know much about that, but, but he learns the art of deployment. He learns how to empower, and it's not just like go do the work, he actually empowers them to do the work. Uh, in, verse, in chapter 4, verse, verse 14, we see that uh, Nehemiah is a, a great encourager. I love this. I, just, I want to read this one to you. Uh, 4, 14 says this, and we, we read this last week. And I looked and I arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Nehemiah was an awesome guy to be around because he understood one of his roles as the leader was he was supposed to be the lead encourager. Encouragement means that I give you courage that you might not have or that you might, forget, you might have forgotten that you had. It's like me bringing courage out in you. I'm not sure of a ton of other things that would be as important on your leadership journey as you being able to encourage people around you. It's, that, that's one of the main reasons why we actually have Sunday morning gatherings. It says, do not, New Testament says, don't neglect the coming together of the saints that we might encourage each other. Because we're easy to forget. We're easy to forget. So Nehemiah uh, was, a, was an encourager of his people along the way. He was also an adapter. In chapter 4, verses 15 through 23, we see that he adapts his methods. So for a while, they were working on the wall, shoulder to shoulder, building things back up again. And then he realizes they're in imminent danger. There's, there's an attack uh, potentially on the way, and it's from this guy named Sam Balat, and he makes these threats, and he's like, yo, we're going to come, and we're going to bring an army, and we're going to bring confusion. So Nehemiah doesn't build as normal. Mid-course, he adapts. He changes things, and he goes, okay, instead of building shoulder to shoulder, half of you are going to build, and then half of you are going to be ready to attack. So the work might be a little bit slower, but we're going to live and we're gonna to work together. So he reads the situation, and he's not afraid to adapt midstream. Adaptation in your journey from onlooker to leader is like super critical. Confrontation, chapter five, verses six through seven. Uh, Nehemiah gets word that there are his own people who have been, uh, uh, it's called exacting interest on loans that they've given to other Jewish people. And so there was this whole economic system where it was pretty easy to take advantage of the poor. You could, you could loan them something to where they could never pay you back and then you could charge them interest, which would basically, could, could basically almost turn them into your servant, where, they, where, where you kind of owned them, although it wasn't like official slavery. And, and Nehemiah has his own people doing this to his own people. And so he gets word about it, and he then goes and confronts them. He's like, what are you doing? Has anybody ever like, confronted you like that? Like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Nehemiah, that, that's his confrontation. He doesn't shy away from it. He doesn't hope it'll get better. He doesn't pray for them over here, thinking like, Lord, like, please help their hearts to become more generous. He actually enters into the situation, and he confronts what needs to be confronted. We see that in um, verses uh, 14 through 19 of that same chapter, Nehemiah has a spirit of generosity. In your journey of leadership, you will come across opportunities for generosity. In order to move from onlooker to leader, this is going to be a, a, a skill that you're going to have to grow in. You're going to have to grow in the skill of generosity. Nehemiah here in this particular context was generous with the food that he received. He was generous with the portions that he was receiving from um, uh, other sources. He was generous uh, because he saw an injustice and stepped into it. I mean, Nehemiah was a generous dude. He didn't take all that he could take so that others around him could actually flourish. And then finally, mindfulness. Man, Nehemiah was incredibly mindful. In chapter 6, verses 3 through 4, we see that there are some guys that come up to him, and they're like, listen, man, we want to talk to you. We're, we're not, we're not, we're not going to necessarily like attack right now. We just want to um, discuss 
kind of like what's going on here. We want to meet you over here. Um, in, I, th I think it's in the plains of Ono. We want to, which should be like enough reason not to go there, right? Like, I'm not going to the plains of Ono. That sounds bad. Okay. Nehemiah somehow knew that, and it's this really cool scene where, uh, and I'll never forget this. This guy named Buzz McNutt back at Spanish River Church, the church that planted us, preached a message like this, and he and he yelled this thing three times, and he yelled it like so loud it stays with me. I won't yell it because I won't do it justice, but, but here, he, he, there's a picture of Nehemiah working on the wall, and his enemies coming, saying, we, we want to meet with you over here, and it was basically a distraction. It was like anything that, that they could do to take Nehemiah off the mission that God had called him to. Even if it wasn't a full-on attack, at least a distraction would be better than nothing. And Nehemiah, he hears their voices, and he turns to them, and he says something like, I'm about a very important work and I cannot come down. Three times the voice has come and Nehemiah is like, I'm about a very important work and I cannot come down. It was like he had this incredible mindfulness to say, I hear what you're saying and I know there might even be some value in me discussing with my enemies, but here's the deal. I'm going to be so focused and so targeted on what God has called me to do here that I can say difficult no's to other things that might take me away from that. Mindfulness on your journey from onlooker to leader is going to be critical. So here's what I want to do uh, with our time remaining. Like, let's, let's bring this from the context of 400 years BC to the context of 2018 where you are right now. And let's talk a little bit about your journey. Whoop. From onlooker to leader. Onlooker to leader. Maybe it's in your home, maybe it's in your church, maybe it's in your city. And then I've got some, some specific um, items that I think we're gonna, we're gonna send you out with. So the first one, calling. Calling. Um, Nehemiah had a calling. You have a calling. The question is, do you know it, and are you following it, or are you pondering it? Are you following your... Con so, those of you who are a bit OCD, you need me to pick this up. So, I'm going to go ahead and pick that up right there. Uh, Alright, now you're back. Calling. <laughs> are you following your calling, or are you pondering your calling? Listen, I'm not saying rush into things. I'm not saying, you know, um, you do things sort of in this, like, irrational manner. I'm saying, um, if you feel like God's put something on your heart, you feel like he's been speaking something to you, maybe a few times, you get some godly community around you that affirms, yeah, that sounds like that. You're reading the word and it, like, popping out. It's like, yeah, man. Then, then you should be leaning into that calling. Or else you're going to remain in the onlooker stage. Your calling might be to, um, maybe you're a student, and it's, and it's like grades, and you're getting close to college time, and, and, and there's all sorts of things that are going to be coming along with that, and, and you feel a calling that you should go to college, and that you should, maybe, maybe even the Lord wants you to go to these two or three specific colleges, but you know the requirements to get in there. Like maybe your calling during this season of life is to dedicate yourself to your academics like you've never done that before. The hand of God upon you for good. Maybe you're hearing that. You're hearing that from godly counsel around you. You're feeling like God really want, wants that for your life. Hey, maybe, maybe you're in a situation where it's like you're a new mom and you're a new dad. And you used to do a lot of things. You used to do a lot of things at church. You used to do a lot of things out in the community, things like that. And now you're just feeling this calling like, man... Like, our new family, they need me here. I, need, I just need more face time with my six-month-old or with my three-year-old, uh, my wife. My, it, it, needs, it needs more of me, my presence. And you've heard that from maybe some other people. You feel like the Lord's in that. That could be a calling. That you need to go home and be more present and be more active in what's going on at home. The question is, are you, are you following that calling or are you continuing to like ponder? Oh, I don't know, that's, that sounds like a, a good idea. Maybe I should get to that when things quiet down at work. Maybe you have a calling at work, man. Maybe you have a calling in this church. Maybe you have a calling with the kids or orphan care or whatever. The question that pertains to us is what are you doing with that calling? Number two, inventory. Inventory. Um, 
as it pertains to your own journey, are, have you defined reality or are you um, sort of existing in this vague comfort? Have you defined reality or are you existing in this vague comfort? Um, and so, whether it's at home, whether it's at your church, or whether it's just in your own personal life, have you taken inventory? Have you, have you really done the job of looking and saying, what, what's going on? What is actually happening here? Or are you continuing to remain in this space back here where you're like, um, I know things aren't great, but I really don't want to take a deeper look because that's super uncomfortable. So I'll just chill here knowing that, yeah, we got to work on that. Work on what? What are you working on? How can you work on something and actually have authority over it unless you can name it and then get after it? Was at a workshop, an exponential church planning conference, and a guy who had fallen from his place as pastor had an extramarital affair. Talked about that very thing. Unless you can name it, you can't have authority over it. How many of us are living with things that are unnamed that will eventually creep up and cripple us because we didn't do the job of taking inventory and calling it what it was? Thirdly, prayer. Uh, what about your prayer? Okay, so, you know, here's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm working through these and I'm just asking you to explore, you know, are you more on the onlooker stage or are you more leaning toward leaders? Onlookers are really good at um, prayer that's a bit sporadic and it doesn't have a ton of intentionality to it. Like, like you know you should pray, and so you, you kind of get after prayer here and there, um, and uh, it's, it's just a bit sporadic, though. There's no real rhythm or, or, or meaning to it. If you find yourself on the journey toward leadership, you're going to find yourself more and more involved in strategic prayer, where you're strategically praying for things. There's a strategy to your prayer life. Why? Because you know that if God doesn't show up, it's not going to work. Like you've put yourself in a situation where it's like, oh Lord, you've got to be God now. Because I'm out here. And so your prayer life changes when you find yourself in leadership moments. Your prayer life changes when you're actually on the journey of leadership. Because you're like, I'm supposed to lead this family. I'm supposed to lead this department. I'm supposed to lead over here in the two to fours. Like, it's, it's, this, it's a leadership critical moment. And so what happens is your prayer life begins to be more strategic about joining God in what he's doing rather than just kind of an occasional sporadic sort of like, I'll pray or, or I won't. Deployment. What about on your journey? Are you more of maybe like a, a doer or somebody who empowers? It's a good place to take a little inventory of yourself. When it comes to deployment, do I do more stuff, or am I known for how I spend time with people to empower them to do more stuff? So that, that's kind of where you can, you can take a look and be like, man, maybe this is a place where I'm stuck on my journey. Maybe I've been praying a little bit more strategically. I've done some inventory work. Um, I, I feel like I've got a calling going on, but I feel like uh, if I don't do it, it's not gonna get done. If that's you in your home or your work or, or your church, then here's what I would say. I would say you're probably a little bit more of an onlooker and what God's doing, I can help you with your calling in this area. God actually wants you to be somebody who leads and empowers others. So rather than figuring out how you can do more, we should spend our time figuring out how can I build relationships with those around me so I can empower them in their gifting to do more. Encouragement. Um, but onlookers, they're, they're more people who come up to, to you and say things like this. I meant to tell you. I meant to text you. I meant to share this with you. And it's like six months after it happened. But if you're actually on that journey toward leadership, you're going to stop what you're going to be doing. It's going to interrupt your day probably multiple times during the day. And you're going to actually send the text that highlights specifically how you might encourage somebody else. You're gonna stop and you're gonna send the text, you're gonna make the call, you're gonna, you're gonna have the appointment. See, that's what leaders do, they understand that they are lead encouragers. So wherever it is that God has you on this journey from onlooker to leader, one of the areas that you know that you really are gonna need to lean into is this area of active 
actually encouraging and, and stopping this nonsense of meaning to encourage. That'd be like me saying, I have great healing power, happiness of heart that I'm going to give to you. Uh, I'm just too busy to give it to you today. Maybe I'll get around to it after I get all my stuff done. I mean, I can't tell you what encouragement does to people, especially people of God who are trying to do supernatural things. I mean, I see how encouragement helps, like my little, my little league team that I coach. I mean, I'm, I'm the encourager out there, I'm in, I'm in, and I'm trying to breathe life into these little guys. Okay, I'm trying to like set them free to be the 12-year-old and 11-year-old little young men that God wants them to be. But I can only encourage them so far. It's the context and things like that, and, and they're, you know, they're trying to get base hits and good things. But like, but, but what about you guys who are, who are trying to lead other people to Christ and who are trying to um, bring healing to damaged marriages and trying to leave porn addiction and trying to do that? What about you? I mean, like you're trying to do some pretty radical, amazing, beautiful things. We can't choke out the power of encouragement by being a people who meant to share it. Meanwhile, we're trying to live over here on the edge, and it's like everything inside us is telling us to inch back. I can't tell you how many times the encouragement of one of you has brought to life, oh, I really can do this. Adaptation, adaptation. Um, so uh, the question here would be, are you changing or are you complaining? I can just leave that one there, right? I don't even. Confrontation, are you moving toward it or are you moving away from it? Generosity. Are you living out of a sense of abundance or are you living out of a sense of scarcity? Like, are you planning to be generous when you have enough money to be generous? When you have enough time? When you have enough things to encourage other people with? Or are you living out of this idea of like, I've got everything I need right now in Christ. I can actually be generous today. On that pathway to leadership, that's going to that's gonna be a stopping place for you. Unless you can trust God with that. And then mindfulness. Mindfulness, uh, do you have a sacrificial focus on what God has called you to in this season? Which obviously can change because we're all adapting. We just talked about that. Or uh, are, do you have a tolerant openness to any and every new and good idea? Like this is hard for me, okay? I just, I just tell you, this is really hard for me because I love good ideas. The problem is good ideas are a robber of like God's ideas. Every good idea is not a God idea, okay? It might be a really awesome idea for another church to do or for another dad to do or for another coach to do. It's just not necessarily what God wants me to do in this particular time and season. And that's really hard for me. It's really, like case in point, if I go into a store to buy a hat or to buy shoes, two things that happen to be Probably too important to me, okay? I just thought it was fast right now. Those are two things, because I really like how hats look, and I really like how shoes look. So, by the way, if you have a cool hat, I already mentioned this Red Sox hat down here. And if you have cool shoes on today, I'm going to try to encourage you in that. <laughs> Besides that, when I go into a store to buy a hat or shoes, here's what happens to me. I get overwhelmed with options. So, so maybe for you, it's like, it's like something else that is way cooler and more spiritual. Like food, you know, the next book you're going to read, or what movie you're going to go see. But for me, shoes and hats. And so what I do is I will be there, I will, and I'll be looking at it, and I'll be trying it on. I'll be like, I don't know, you know, like my wife's like, she's like, you don't look good in flat brim hats because you got that skinny face. I'll be like, yeah, but babe, they're super cool. I share it with my son. She likes me to get the right. So anyway, so I've got that going on, and then like with the shoes, I'm like, ooh, are they too small? Are they too tight? I don't know. Can I feel my toes? I, I go super OCD, right? And then I'm like, well, how do they look? And then it's weird, you're like looking at your feet as you walk through this. Stuff. I can spend so much awkward, weird time in one of those places trying to make a decision. You know why? Because when I finally do make a decision, I had to say no to all those other good things. Mindfulness is the ability to say no to a ton of good stuff so that you might get after the God stuff. So how do we do this? Here's how, the, here's how the gospel sort of flips this. 
We'll call it the Jesus way. You have that on your outline there. Again, at that uh, exponential conference, the theme of, of the exponential conference was hero maker. Hero maker. Uh, the Jesus way is, is how those who follow Christ become the leaders that God's called them to be. They do it the Jesus way. And in the New Testament, here's how it defines Jesus' leadership. It defines it like this. He who was rich became poor so that others around him might become rich. Translation, Jesus, who had all things, was at the right hand of the Father, completely uh, inundated with the blessings of being next to God the Father. God the Son, God the Father, God the Spirit. The triune God in perfect community and harmony. They take inventory on you and on me and they see a problem. And so, God the Son is sent to, to, to forfeit temporarily his riches with God the Father, his relationship with God the Father, to become poor, to become one of us, to not simply be able to relate to us, but to then go to a cross and not just be our equal, but be our sacrifice. He who was rich and pure and holy and righteous. You know how you love purity once you become a Christian? You can't always attain it. You don't always walk in it. But you know when you're walking, like right in the, the center of God's will, how that feels? It's like, oh, that is what? Oh. The Father loves me. I love people. I'm giving my life away for people. This feels so good. So Jesus lives in that experience, like from eternity past, and then says, I'm going to go ahead and give that up in order to not just come and be with them, but to go to a cross. And to trade my experience of purity and righteousness for their lusts, for their lies, for their deceit, for the things they don't do that break the heart of the Father, for the things they do that break the heart of the Father. Like, I will absorb because I've taken inventory, and if they are left in this situation, they're going to be separated from a holy and righteous God. I will become poor. I will give up this so that I can come and take on their sin and be crushed in their place. Father, punish me so you don't have to punish them. I will, I will give it away, and I will receive the wrath that they deserve so that they might be forgiven and receive the inheritance that I've always had. That's the gospel message. On the third day, Jesus is brought back from the dead. And he offers that message. He, uh, he gives that invitation to people just like me who are bent on self but somehow get stopped in the midst of their tracks because of the Spirit of God and say, I can't do this anymore. Jesus, I trust you as both my Savior, my sacrifice, and my treasure. I want you. That's what it means to come to faith in Christ. That's what some of you, that's what you need to do today, is you need to get rich in Christ. You need to give up your spiritual poverty. You need to give up your, your, your lack of purpose. You need to give up that hole in your soul that you can't really take a good inventory for, but you know it's not right. You need to say, I'm quitting on me because me never got me what I wanted. And Jesus, I'm believing you are my treasure. Coming to him in that way is what it means to be born again. Is what it means to be, actually begin your journey from onlooker to the leader that God's called you to. That's the Jesus way. That's the Jesus way of leadership. That we would lead in such a fashion so that we become poor so that others might flourish. Now my 16 year old daughter uh, does, uh, I love her to death. Her name's Carolyn. I'm not gonna point out where she's sitting right now. I'm not going to do that at all. But what I am going to do is I'm going to use an example of, of how she sort of did the opposite of this. And maybe she did it for this message I was going to preach. So I'm th thank you, Caroline, for, for giving us the opposite of this. Because Caroline has a, a beautiful, wonderful heart that's been born again and loves Jesus. But in this particular moment, when Mike and Ike were involved, <laughs> things went bad. 
Now, if my memory serves me right, because sometimes when I get home, my kids will correct me on the story. They'll be like, no, it wasn't Mike and Ike's, it was Starburst. So whether it was Mike and Ike's or Starburst, here's what was happening in this particular um, moment. Now remember, this is, this is flipped, the, the not Jesus way. Um, so we were, I was driving back then, and, and she was eating, and so I asked for a few Mike and Ike's or Starburst or whatever the case may be. And so I got the first handful, and then I got the second handful, and I realized what she was doing. What my lovely, beautiful 16-year-old daughter was doing is she was giving me all of the yellows. <laughs> you remember that, don't you? You're, are you filming this right now? Yeah, yes, okay. Alright. So you can check this out on Instagram later. She was giving me all the yellows! Who does that? First of all, the yellows are only... Who likes yellows? Okay, okay, some of you, alright? But you can only like yellows for so long. The yellows, I think, are actually in there so that you can actually enjoy more of what you really came for, which are the reds and the, and the, the pinks and even the oranges. You don't want to give yellows away, so I called her out on it. I was like, girl, what's the deal? You're giving me yellows. And she immediately started to laugh. You know, she knew. She was busted. I confronted her. I took inventory. I'm like, I'm getting yellows. This is not good. She got those sweet pains. It's like, oh, I can endure one or two to get to what I really want. Give me the goods. So I was in the store yesterday and I saw these bags called um, Fave Reds. Have you seen these? Fave Red. Fave Reds are awesome because here's what they did is they basically, they basically prevented my daughter from ever doing this again. And in this bag, okay, so don't, don't be offended if this hits you, but I'm just going to throw some of these out. In this bag are the reds and the pinks and um, the oranges, which everybody really likes. In this bag, you don't have to go through yellows. You don't have to go through any of the type of flavors that you might want to give away to somebody. I know she loves me, but you know what I'm saying, like some, somebody you could give a yellow to, and it might be okay. Now, there's gonna be Starburst on the ground here, that's okay, because when the school comes in, they can just remember that Jesus was here and he made things sweeter, okay? So, somehow somehow that, that'll be worked out. Now I'm behind you, so I might hit you in the back of the head if you're not paying attention. I won't do that. Look, I'm just gonna do what I'm doing right there. As we think about not giving away the yellows, this guy's got his hand out like it's communion. I like that. This is, this is kind of like the Avenue Church version of some, you know, sweet communion with Jesus. As we think about this idea of like, hey, in my leadership, am I giving out yellows or am I giving out the pinks and the reds that people actually want? That are actually going to cause me a little bit of pain? Because, yo, I really want the reds. I really want the pink. Here's what Jesus does. Here's what Jesus He finds you specifically, personally, and he's like, listen, I know your past. I know what you've done. I know who you've been with. I know what you've put into your body. I know the injustice that you want to go right by and you didn't do anything about it. I know all about you, and I know what you're going to do tomorrow. This is what I got for you. This is what I got for you. Right here. That's the Jesus way. That's how Jesus leads. I know you, and still here's a red. And still here's a pink, because it gives my heart desire. It gives my heart delight to do that. So as we close up, call the team to come out. Um, I just want to ask you this question. I mean, the first and most important question is, have you received that? Like, you know how you receive that? You know how Jeremy received that? He didn't take the bag from you. You know what he did? He was like this. That's how you receive Jesus. You receive what's been done for you. Believe that the good is coming through Jesus. And secondly, I was like thinking through, man, like how do we apply this? You know, we could leave some general application. But, but something that all of us do on a consistent basis is work. And we all go to some form of work, even if it's volunteer work. I just wonder, in your work, are you willing to lead where you are right now with no promotion, no title? I think 
man, if we as Christians grew in our leadership ability right where we are, if we went from more onlooker to leader right where we were, I think we could, I think we could potentially change the world. Not by volunteering more heat or doing this, doing this. Simply at your place of work, if you took a step of understanding that I am a called missionary in this field, if you took a, an inventory of what's going on around you, if you begin to strategically pray for those people that are at your place of work, even if your place of work is home, man, if you are strategically praying for if you begin to learn the art of deployment of those around you, if you become known as this crazy girl who always is encouraging others, I don't get her but she's always writing notes, sending texts. It's super awkward sometimes, but I like it. You became a person of adaptation, confrontation in loving and meaningful ways, generosity at your work. If you have power to give a raise, if you have power to pay more, if you have power to give more time, then give it away so that others might flourish. You might be a person of mindfulness at hand. You don't take every greatest and latest idea, but you stay focused in obedience to what God's called you to do. Man, I love this last song that we're going to sing. It's called Tremble. And uh, we're going to have our prayer partners come forward. If you're one of those prayer partners, would you come on up and get to my left and your right? We'd love to pray over you guys. The Lord's kind of one or two of these areas, you realize, man, like, I just need somebody, I need somebody to pray over me. Like, I can try harder, but I don't want to keep trying harder. I like want God to intervene and do a work in me. We'd love to pray over you. If you want to know what it's like to receive that kind of love from Jesus, man, we'd love to do that with you. Well, our prayer partners are going to be coming up while the song goes on. The cool part about this song is it's called Tremble, and it's all about calling out on the name of Jesus to do what only He can do. If you want to lead the Jesus way, if you want to enjoy this journey, man, Jesus does it in us and through us, and he loves to do it. So let's call out on his name right now. Love that name. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, bro. And we serve a great and awesome and risen Lord. And so today, as we go out, man, just the question that I want to leave you with is this week, what are you going to be defined by? How will other people describe your week? Will it be a week full of yellows? Where like you gave away what you could because you really didn't want it anyways? Or will you be described? And that, that person gave away his pets. She gave away her pinks. And people flourished around her. That's what I want my life to be about. Your flourishing. Jesus can do. Now may the God who became poor so that we might become rich enrich you with his reds and his pinks and his great love for you so that you might give that to others with great joy. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. Thank you.